I think we can begin. Uh, so welcome back to the final session uh, on representation and subjectivities, thinking from the model. Uh, following the lead of earlier moderators, I won't introduce the speakers, but I encourage you to read their bios uh, online. So I uh, interpreted and, and perhaps I did, uh, did it incorrectly, but the model as referring to art and world cultures, museums, their practices, processes, and priorities. And so my gentle suggestion to the panelists was that their presentations be largely concerned with their respective artistic, uh, curatorial, and scholarly practices, uh, including their political, ethical, and social concerns, uh, and, your experience, and their experiences, um, and perhaps predictions, and also hopes uh, in relation to art and world cultures museums. Um, so I think that's enough from me, and I'd like to invite the first speaker, uh, Nancy, Nancy Yawa. Hi, everyone. Um, it's interesting, my phone goes <laughs> as I'm trying to start. That's so uh, typical. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Um, my name is um, Nancy Yao, and I... Um, uh, I'm very happy, first of all, that I uh, am part of this conversation and thank you to the organizers for um, inviting me. Um, and um, um, uh, second of all, I'll talk around seven to 10 minutes um, and I'm not sure if I'm going to follow uh, Erna's um, uh, lead in what I have to talk about. I just want to share some notes uh, around representation and I hope that also to contextualize a little bit and I hope that we can then bring it more specifically to the museum as we have our conversation uh, together. So hopefully that's okay with you, Erna. Um, so yeah, my name is Nancy Yawa. Um, so I'm a cultural historian, um, writer and researcher, mostly uh, writing on Dutch colonial history and its afterlives. Um, I'm also the daughter of a political uh, Papuan political leader uh, born in the Netherlands as part of a diaspora community of political refugees who fled West Papua and um, 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 as Indonesia took hold of the western part of the island of New Guinea. And so my family itself actually resides from both West Papua and uh, Papua New Guinea. And so I was part of the advisory group, group for the exhibit and uh, the part on, on New Guinea and was invited to write uh, in an accompanying uh, catalog. And um, I suggested to do this with the uh, visual painter, uh, visual artist, painter and curator Dicky Takandara. Uh, so he will talk after me. And so in uh, the summer of 2020, we helped, held several conversations uh, online about the paintings and watercolors of um, Papuans by Emil Nolde. Um, and we wrote that down, um, our gaze, um, as Nolde was in, imposing his colonial gaze on the Papuans that he saw. Um, and we wrote uh, some notes on, on that um, in the catalog um, that accompanies this um, exhibit. So um, I'm not going to talk too much about what we said there, but we might also touch upon it in the conversation. So as Papuans of uh, different generations, Diki and I, I'm talking about, um, I'm living in the diaspora while Diki lives in Indonesia. We shared views and different thoughts on uh, Nolda's work, but um, the conversations were also held in the middle of the COVID pandemic and the global Black Lives Matter demonstrations. And therefore the exchanges very much also were fused with an acute awareness of the ongoing precariousness of Papuan lives both then and uh, now. Um, so as Papuans, I guess, um, both in Indonesia and the diaspora in Europe, we're only too aware of dominant representations which are fused with colonial tropes, we think about Papuans. So to go back to colonial history briefly, um, the island, um, uh, New Guinea's, uh, um, um, uh, was cut in two colonial halves in 1848 and um, 
So the, the Germans and the English were on the eastern part, the Dutch were at the western part, and my family's my father's family actually resided on both sides of these colonial halves using their own sort of vernacular or indigenous maps kind of unbothered by these European interventions and uh, the land that was colonized by the Dutch at the time is now divided into two Indonesian provinces called provinces called Papua and West Papua and uh, for many Papuans uh, living there, uh, uh, the, the presence of Indonesia, of being part of Indonesia is also very much seen as a neo-colonial situation. But this colonial backdrop has informed the Western world also about Papuans in a specific way. Papuans are often still captured in colonial representations wherein race and gender intersect and stereotypes are pe perpetuated. Um, and basically, Papuans are typically still seen as the most uh, sort of primitive peoples on earth. Um, and this primitive man, it's often also gendered as a man, is the complete opposite of dominant Western beauty and intellectual standards and remains in the Western mind confined to a very static and ahistorical presence and culture. So for instance, we can find this back in, in, in the, the poem of a very well, a very revered and loved Dutch poet, M. Fazalis, in her poem, uh, Rebus in the Bus, first um, um, published in 2002. She is puzzled by the presence of Papuans riding in a bus up north in, in the Netherlands. So I'll, I'll, I'll begin in Dutch, she, uh, one quote, where she says, een Papua familie drents van spraak, zo lief, zo lelijk en zo onbevangen. A Papuan family speaking a local Dutch dialect, so sweet, so ugly and so in uninhibited. So here we see the use of a couple of well-known tropes like the ugly and childlike Papuan that we see very often. And in 2011, Dutch right-wing philosopher Paul Kliter published his book, Modern Papuans, again, leaning very much on, uh, on another image of a closed singular culture misusing um, this trope of Papuans for his right-wing agenda, which um, um, uh, made a lot of us also very angry, uh, us being Dutch Papuans. Um, so dominant colonial frames that still inform a Dutch public about Papuans and um, um, especially you can st see that still being sort of used and reused in, in Dutch media up to today is the notion of the primitive, which we've talked about already, uh, people residing in the Stone Age, but also people standing very much outside of history. Uh, and of course, the noble savage, although that's a trope that's not used a lot, I would say, in the Netherlands, although it is there. And so these interactions in, in, in sort of, sort of um, these convivial everyday interactions uh, where I'm being reminded of being a Papuan um, was, for instance, 2012, where I was interviewed on Dutch public radio for having curated a photo exhibit on Papuans in the Netherlands. Um, the presenter basically started off the interview by making a penis gourd joke, asking if I had brought some with me. And so I replied that I did not know his size and had come empty handed um, in order to get on with the interview. And we can yeah, consider this a display of white innocence where racist remarks are uttered under the guise of a bit of fun thus falling back of, on, on, of, of being innocent of, of racism. And I see you laughing and about the joke, but um, yeah. And so, um, but also, you know, with people who would you, you who would uh, be considered as quote unquote allies, um, uh, I used to be uh, um, the director of a small, uh, uh, NGO uh, or uh, foundation called uh, Foundation Papua Culture Heritage um, in the 2000s where a board member reminded me and not, not unimportant, he was the son of a famous Dutchman who had worked in colonial New Guinea. He reminded me, quote unquote, that the Dutch did not really colonize Papua because all they did bring was, uh, all they did was bring, not take. 
and um, disbelief in an alleged enlightened Dutch colonial practice and the Christianity subsumed with that practice um, must have been very comforting for, for him and, and his family. But yet we should remember M.A. Cesar's words when he stated that colonial colonizers were not spreading civilization, but rather destroying them. So um, as we then enter the, the museum and the museum as a, as a space of representation, um, um, al already the Papuan uh, gaze, uh, Papuan diaspora gaze is already very much informed in a certain way. But we should also be mindful of the fact that um, for many Papuans in the diaspora, diaspora um, the museum is, uh, has a high um, threshold also. And for, for many of us, the immaterial culture um, is actually um, our way of um, uh, uh, keeping our culture uh, alive rather than sometimes even the material culture. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, you, you were more than welcome to go outside of my suggestions. That was there as a um, possible avenue. So thank you very much. I think that um, paints a picture very clearly for everyone who's not familiar. Uh, and so next I'd uh, like to invite uh, Diki Takandara uh, to speak. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for the opportunity they gave to me um, <clears throat> for all the organizers and Kaka Nancy. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, wait a minute, I have to stop the uh, orders. <laughs> Uh, Ned. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh, our artist uh, work all night. Um, hey, uh, I am Diki Secondary, and I am uh, my best uh, art visual artist uh, from West Papua. I came from Sentani, Lake Sentani area. Uh, it's about 50 kilometers to the borderline of Papua and Papua New Guinea. And I am now based in Yogyakarta City in Java Island in Indonesia. So uh, you have been a lot about uh, Nold and Kirchner and, and uh, all the scholars and uh, curators and uh, professors talking about him and about uh, Roshenia cultural maps and art. And um, artists, I will talk much about uh, my artistic approach and uh, how the geopolitical situation in West Papua uh, influenced our work. And so uh, before I talk, uh, I really apologize if some uh, viewers get things that uh, my presentation really sensitive <laughs> because in Indonesia, it's all, always and always sensitive to talking about West Papua's issue. Okay. I, try to share my okay uh. oh uh sander do you do you uh do it for me well, uh, this presentation is going to be divided into three parts. First of all, is the uh, geopolitical background of West Papua, but I think uh, it's already done by Nancy. And then uh, I want to talk about the curatorial practices that uh, 
held by uh, Mr. Uh, Arnold Lapp in the past that really influenced that uh, to uh, the next generation of uh, artists in West Papua. Okay, uh, as you know, uh, uh, after the World War II uh, situation in, in Pacific, uh, many regions get their independence step by step, but uh, Papua, West Papua uh, gets really complicated and until now, after Indonesia take place, uh, the demands of self-determination become higher and higher every time. And uh, we have a lot of tanks and a lot of operation military. Many people get killed, and uh, most of them are civilians, women and children. So uh, that's uh, the situation that faced by uh, West Papua from the colonial times to neo-colonial times today. Okay, next. And uh, um, next, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you came to West Papua today, uh, when I say West Papua is the uh, western part of the island, because uh, if you came to West Papua today, uh, West Papua is, uh, is also the name of the province that uh, given by Indonesian authority. Okay, next. <clears throat> In a particular situation where uh, dominant nationalism representation of Indonesia and, and West Papua uh, demands for freedom appears, uh, people uh, ask for what is uh, practice or movement that fit to the situation that faced by the people. And in 1970, around that, uh, the museum called Lokabudaya Museum in Jaipura, the capital of West Papua, appointed Mr. Arnold Lapp to become uh, the curator of the museum, and he was the first uh, uh, indigenous curator of West Papuans. And uh, the situation that he faced that day is uh, there are two big issues. First of all, uh, there are two big issues regarding the cultural identity of West Papuans. Um, the first one, uh, back around 19... Uh, 12 to 1920s. Uh, so it's around that time when uh, Nolde uh, was in German's New Guinea. Uh, the Christian missionary uh, held a massive operation to fight or force the local beliefs in West Papua. So they're collecting all the stuff, the sculpting, the painting, all the uh, uh, what you call material culture or maybe artifact that connected or uh, affiliated with the local uh, belief, they put it together and burnt it. Um, and, and in my homeland, uh, they because it, it was lake, it is lake, and in my homeland, they threw it into the lake. So uh, it was a very big uh, movement that really influenced the uh, uh, cultural situation of West Papua that day. And, uh, the church really, really uh, play a main role uh, to the uh, curriculum of uh, education and and and, and uh, something like that. And the second situation is uh, after Indonesian take power of of West Papua, uh, the militarist, militaristic uh, system and approach and uh, centralization curriculum it, it's uh, held by Indonesian government so uh, our children our uh, young uh, people have to learn about Japanese kingdoms Japanese kings and queens their times their uh, area territory and everything uh, and it's happened uh, for a long time so that the situation that faced by Mr. Arnold up uh, those time and when he uh, when he appointed to become a curator, he tried to make his approach by uh, visit the the village uh, to village and visit all the traditional artists and uh, make a campaign uh, about the awakening identity of Papuans and uh, invite them to come to Jaipura and give them seminars and send them back and documenting their uh, works and. Uh, make exhibition uh, to 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 uh, presenting their works and every uh, every single uh, practice just like to done by the curator and uh, he also do the radio shows uh, 
that where he's singing the traditional songs and also uh, telling the folklore the way the engineers, local people are uh, telling. So uh, uh, what make Arnold really, really unique is critical approach is, is that he really enforced with the people. So uh, he really received by the people. Uh, I think it's because of the situation that they, uh, there are our leaders, uh, just like you heard from Nancy, there are a lot of our leaders have to exile uh, regarding this uh, security. And a lot of uh, our leaders get assassinated and murdered and just disappear. And uh, so they see Arnold practice as a awakening movement of uh, cultural identity of Papua. Um, in 1980s, uh, he founded a group of Mambesak as one of his curatorial approach. And Mambesak is a music group and they are um, uh, singing all the folk song of uh, many tribes in Papua from land uh, from the coast to the mountain. Um, Mambesak uh, really popular at times and when they held a concert of, uh, yeah, when they have concert and many people come to Jay just to visit Arnold Lab. This picture is absolutely shows how uh, Arnold really close to the people. This is the picture with Mr. Suleiman Nari, the big chief of uh, Ormo village or Ormo uh, community in Jaipur, uh, come to museum and give the uh, artifact, give the uh, sacred stone to Arnold because they think Arnold is a new leader. So uh, that's very common things that happen to Arnold. Uh, many leaders uh, come to him and, and get sit and telling stories with him and give something to him. So when you are in uh, Europe, you show the artifact that you uh, maybe stole from the uh, colonial uh, area. Arnold get the artifact as a gift from the people. Um, the important things that make Arnold really, really unique in his curatorial approach, curatorial approach is that Arnold see uh, the things or the stuff in, within the museum as uh, living things. He believed that all the things uh, inside the museum have souls and uh, just like us, uh, they breathe and they, they, they can talk to you, something like that. So it's really influenced of, on how he he displaying and how he treat all the uh, collection. Yeah, next. Uh, uh, Arnold was assassinated, was assassinated in 1984, 26 April. And uh, after that time, the days when he got assassinated, uh, when the days of 26 April and 15 August, when he uh, co-founded Mambesak, uh, all the pap ones gathering together to celebrate uh, the day that we call this uh, the United Pap Ones Day. So the people are. Uh, from every tribe and community in Papua United in the spirit of Mambesak. Um, uh, this 5 August uh, was proposed to become the, uh, was proposed by the uh, Indigenous Council of West Papuan to become the uh, uh, Papuan Cultural Identity Awakening Day. It's uh, about a month ago. Uh, okay. Next. Uh, yeah. After Arnold died, uh, his legacy became the symbols of the United Papuans. So uh, when we talk about uh, unification or, or, or united uh, every tribes in, in the West Papua become one uh, Papuans, uh, just, just say Mambesak. OK, uh, next. Yeah, yeah, uh, and after Arnold, uh, one of my best persons, Edimov, also get assassinated uh, two weeks before Arnold. 
And this is the Luka Buddha Museum in uh, uh, Jaipur. Uh, yeah, Luka Buddha is the name of uh, Sanskrit word, so it's familiar to Japanese. And that time, away, some Papuan's tongue or some Papuan words became the name of the museum. Okay, next. This is the leaf letter posters uh, spread every year to remembering a Mambasak Day or we call it a Papuan United Day. Next. Uh, yeah, next. The next generation of uh, Arnold, next. The next generation of Arnold uh, faced the same situation. And this is, okay, stop. Uh, faced the same situation and, and not really different. Uh, we have uh, not uh, a lot of freedom of expression and many things, and many activists and leaders get uh, murdered and uh, captured. So uh, the situation is still tense uh, until today, uh, right now when I talk. This is uh, the Edu Collective, the, my best collective, and we uh, founded in 2018. Uh, um, we realized that we came from the next generation. We grew up with uh, Superman, Batman, and uh, Spider-Man, something like that. And, uh, and we also have a curiosity on how our ancestors do down in the past, how they living, what are their beliefs, because uh, all of those things are really, really uh, uh, hard to uh, see, uh, um, hard to find in the society that really plural, uh, really, really, really uh, uh, pressed uh, today. And the Edu Collective uh, try to uh, uh, digging back to the past, uh, try to learn about our, our, our archives and, and, and try to see uh, uh, taking all the uh, concept or uh, life philosophy of the ancestor and uh, use it to make a new kind of uh, contemporary works to talking about the present situation, present condition of uh, West Papua that we face today. Next. So our uh, movement is uh, more like uh, activism <laughs> art or something like that. Yeah, uh, this is our first uh, project that we held in the Yogyakarta, one of Yogyakarta village, because uh, that time, uh, okay, stop. Uh, that time, uh, uh, you know, if you come to some Java, I, I, Java, Java city here in Indonesia, uh, people say that uh, West Papuans or Papuan students are not really adapted with the situation, how uh, the, the local people live. And uh, they are stereotyped that Papuan people are primitive and they are uh, drunkards and they are troublemakers. And we get a lot of uh, discrimination and racism. If you came to, uh, there are a common story that appears in Papuan students that if you came to try to find a room for rent because you study in the city, and then uh, you make appointment with the owner and you came there and they see you as a pop once and they, they rejected you. They said, okay, you have a full room. You cannot stay here, blah, 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 blah. And this is the common situation that faced by Papua students in the uh, Indonesian cities. So uh, we, we discussed this in the, in the collectives and we said, uh, look, you remember the uh, treatment, by, uh, treatment by paintings in the cave? Yes, remember the two very megalithic sites in Santani? Yes, yes, uh, our ancestors, they go to some place and they leave traces. They paint in some places and uh, it became the trace that they, the Papuans ever be there uh, beautifully. So uh, what we done is we go to one village in, in, in one village in Yogyakarta and we talk to the owner of the house. Look, we want to uh, painting your walls and and he agreed. So we painting those walls with uh, with uh, purple and ornaments, and and uh, it's become the trace that that we can do something beautiful. We can we can adapt it. 
So it's kind of resistance uh, in, 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 in art. Okay, uh, next. <clears throat> uh, this is the second uh, project that we've held. Next, yeah. Next. Yeah, uh, this is our, uh, stop. This is our uh, project with the refugee of Duga. So in 2018, uh, there are fight between uh, the freedom fighter of uh, West Papua with the uh, military forces of Indonesia in the Duga area uh, in the highland of West Papua. And around 70,000 people have to flee uh, the area and many of them are children. So uh, they go to every direction and most of them go to the Wamena regions uh, nearby uh, the Nduga regions. So uh, what we've done is uh, we, we go there and uh, make some healing treatment, healing, healing, healing process, a healing uh, class <laughs> with the children. And uh, uh, they really love drawings and uh, we, we direct them to drawing what they want to be in the future because um, it's really hard to have a dream uh, in the situation. They live in a starving uh, situation and uh, not appropriated condition in the refugee camp in their own land. So uh, some of them uh, make a drawing about their dreams. Um, that time we successfully uh, sold it in Amsterdam. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. And uh, the money go to, go to, uh, to the NGO that sent them a doctor, a team of doctor. Okay, next. Did I still have time? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's too interesting to uh, rush on and I think we have, we've, we can do it. Go on. <laughs> yeah, okay. Go on, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is some of their uh, drawings. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Next. So, uh, in our collective, you also discuss about the things you dis dis discussed in, in this symposium. Uh, where's the ethnology? Where's the contemporary art? And we think, okay, uh, we're just working and, and try to do something with what we have, uh, just let the break, uh, just let the scholars uh, uh, divine what we've done. So um, what we've done is uh, we try to use some ethnological uh, material or concepts and uh, use it to make uh, work that we put into contemporary art venue, museum or, or gallery, something like that. Okay, next. Next is one of the drawings shows the military come to bombing the area. Okay, next. Uh, sorry, I have to uh, blur their names. They're still there. Next. Yeah, this is our next programs in the village of Yokiwa in Sentan. Uh, we held a uh, uh, clean up action and then uh, make an uh, installation of one indigenous feast, uh, endemic feast of the Hayao. Um, and in the exhibition, we held the ceremony called uh, Ahoy Hoy, is a ceremony to, to uh, welcoming the people who came by after they uh, uh, take to go hunting or uh, to go fishing, and they come with the a lot of uh, stuff, a lot of uh, uh, things they already get. And uh, the ceremonial goes in our ways. So the, the ceremonial run by the children, but what comes is the fish with the trash that we collected from the uh, lake. Uh, that time, uh, many tribal, our tribal leaders uh, 
feels shock because it's it's a kind of sacred uh, ceremony in the past, but uh, uh, we do it with installation and something like that. Okay, next. Uh, we stay there for one month to teaching children and 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 they also uh, do their drawings and paintings and talking about their uh what they see in their environment this is one of our ceremony <laughs> with fresh okay uh this is the last part uh uh months ago uh jokja bnla get uh, uh make uh, their last edition of uh, Equator uh, series and the last one is Oceania and we take part of uh, this uh, event and um, and and uh, the important things for me is uh, that uh, we we also uh, do something that we maybe you think is really really ethnological terms but uh, uh, we put it into some contemporary venue, our contemporary venue. It's like, you know, uh, we came by to one community from people of Tambrao in West Papua, uh, in West region of, uh, West coast of region of Papua. And we said, look, we make uh, installation, every one of work make, one of us make our works. And we talk about the living space of us that already taken and, many discrimination and many people died and uh, the land is uh, changed to become something else, residences or a mining corporation, something like that. And, and uh, we try to make a reconstruction of the our old belief called Koreri, uh, the living space where we can live in harmony, in peace. And we try to reconstruct it in our room in the Jogja Binal venue and uh, that, Installation also talk about our collective memory on the past, our people, uh, and what happened in our people and our land and everything. And the community said, okay, we take part. So they came, about 20 of them, and they present the dancing of Serar. The dancing of Serar is a very sacred dancing in the Tambrao people. And they uh, because usually it it's performed uh spontaneously uh the the prayer and the singing talk about uh the most recent updating situation that faced by the community so uh they also do it in the inside the museum uh where where joke jebenal uh taking place but they do it with uh, the new narration the narration of uh global West Papuan's uh, discourses, West Papuan situa situation, and uh, every little things that uh, we want to raise uh, the voice. Next, yeah. So uh, when people in, in uh, when you in the previous uh, talk discuss about the divide of ethnology and uh, art, uh, in today the collective we put it to be one to we try to elaborate uh, uh, ethnology and art to become one work the time we also do a perform uh Vicky, is this uh, the the final set of yeah. slides? Yeah, great. Sorry, have to, yeah, it's okay. It's 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 uh, it's done. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I, I I let that go over time because I don't know when we'll have another opportunity um, to speak with you and to hear about all of this uh, really amazing uh, work that you're involved with. Um, so I hope the uh, the panelist gods forgive me for that. Yeah, I apologize for uh, all the panelists and uh, take some of your times. <laughs> That's okay. We'll take it out of my time at the end. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you very much. And next, I'd really like to hear from Lisa Healy. Thanks, Erna. Hello, everyone. 
Wow, Dicky, that was amazing. <laughs> wow. Um, I am based, I'm just going to share, um, I guess, uh, my artwork, my process practices, and I guess the thinking behind them. Um, uh, what do I need to do? I need to share a screen, don't I? <laughs> okay. Okay, can you all see that? Oh yeah. Um, so uh, my name is Lisa Hilly. I'm an artist and researcher based um, on Wurundjeri country here in Melbourne. Um, and uh, it's pretty late here. So if I seem a bit slow, it's cause it's really, I'm really tired. <laughs> um, being a Tolai woman, um, I am from a matrilineal culture, so I thought I'd better start with the matriarch of my family, which is my mum. She's wearing an artwork that I made called Vunatare Ama. Vunatare in my language uh, is uh, matrilineal clan. And uh, the work that she's wearing is, a, um, I guess, a, a feminine interpretation of Tolai Midi. And Midi was like my entry point into museum collections. Um, and uh, a lot of museum collections, particularly from the Pacific, are very male dominated. And so being a, from a matrilineal culture, I decided to try and invert that um, history. And also that um, the actual ornaments of that particular work, you can see that they're actually paper tags. And so I was actually subverting the, um, the museum taxonomy systems of, you know, always preferencing the collectors, collectors' names and the histories of uh, collectors and you know, uh, basically the Papua New Guinea people being erased in terms of makers and the knowledge. And so I inserted my clan totem into the actual museum tags and then just basically made it um, into a, back into a body adornment. And so it actually references this particular item, which is the MIDI. Um, this is the MIDI that I made as part of my master's research. Um, this man is Damien Kedeku, who's uh, since passed away. And he's standing on his land just in front of um, Mount Tuvuruvut, which is the volcano that's still active today in Rabaul. Um, and uh, he's, he, he seemed to be the right person to wear this particular object because um, he was a man of status. Um, and uh, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with him, um, but he was the chairman of the Matangwin Association and they were a grassroots political movement in the 60s um, under the Australian administration of Papua New Guinea and um, essentially uh, basically led that grassroots initiative, um, which was challenging the multiracial council at, of the time um, because we were basically, Tola people were being excluded from any say um, and rights to how we were, going, we, were, we were being governed essentially. So it, it was men like Damien and Oscar Tamura and, um, and many others who actually fought for um, the people of East New Britain province as it's known today. Um, and yeah, this, so for me, this was about putting the object back on the body rather than seeing it um, just in a museum um, kind of lifeless. And so, um, yeah, that was, that took me a year to, to remake and it was all about, you know, understanding the currency of um, the shells that exist in my, in my culture. Um, and also just really, I guess at its core, it was understanding um, these three things of identity, status and protection. And that's what that object does. Uh, that's what it signifies when people wear it. And it was just, it was about recontextualizing and understanding the history of that object and what it means to tell our people today. Um, so I am also doing a PhD project um, uh, by practice at the Australian National University. And in, in the last few years of my practice, I've been working a lot with um, archives and photographic um, images. Um, photo photography is the foundation of my practice. I also work across with video and textiles. Um, uh, I started doing a... Um, I did a scholarship of um, Museums Victoria's collections here in Melbourne and was really interested in this um, missionary Reverend Rickard who um, 
basically translated my language, my language into the written word. And so this was the site of the first, where the first missionary arrived into what is today known as Duke of York Islands, which was a really significant site for um, a lot of ships, a lot of um, traders. And um, I just, I'm, I've been playing around with sort of, you know, just trying to shift, shift the focus, inverting the gaze, but also working with it when I can. Um, so these are some of the middies um, as well that are held in the Australian Museum that I found. And some of these had trade beads in them, as you can see, and that, that speaks very much to the um, colonial history of plantations and missionary contact. Um, and I was, when I first found these objects, I, I was really curious to know how glass beads got into these objects that were made by my people. And so there was kind of like this massive unpacking of looking at trade beads essentially in the history of it and actually trying to explore that visually um, particularly through um, through photographic works as well so it was just about shifting the focus back to to women um, because they're not actually the focus of this particular image and um, but also putting back the history of the beads of how you know first contact was made and just just kind of shifting that kind of dimension um, of focus in terms of history and who who gets prioritized because the women in this image aren't really they're kind of like props and so I just um I wanted to basically kind of shift the composition of that um, particular image so that was kind of part of a bigger work that looks a bit distorted that image um this is a work called value systems um which is still unpacking this idea of um of the trade beads and so I was really interested in how uh, trade beads or slave beads as they were known was used as a mechanism um, for building rapport um, and also form of payment in copper plantations and so uh, it was it was there was I was just trying to unpack the history of within the actual glass beads themselves and, and within the installation you can see there's um there's there's also um there's lots of different forms of currency so there's British Papua shillings there's uh, Deutschmark, there's also um, Papua New Guinea and Kina, and then there's a photo locket as well, because it was kind of, I was trying to connect it back into this idea of um, body adornment as well, because that's where the, you know, that's where I found the beads, and um, yeah, it was just, it was just basically playing with this whole idea of, um, of adornment, history of plantations, and all the different colonial aspects that have kind of governed Papua New Guinea, um, so many. And so um, it was just, uh, yeah, I think I'll just go to the next slide. Um, so I'm also doing um, a fellowship with the German Maritime Museum um, for since April this year. Um, that's, I'm affiliated with this project, looking at the North German Lloyds. Uh, I'm working with, um, Tobias Scobell, um, who's based um, in Bremen. And um, I am looking at the movement of Asian and Pacific bodies on German ships across um, the Asian and Pacific region, partially with, partially with a focus on Rabaul, because if you understand the German colonial history in Rabaul, it's very, it's, there, there's, there was a, it was a very cosmopolitan city in terms of a lot of Asian people came in, a lot of other Pacific people came in, um, and there's still those legacies that exist today. And um, I was in a conference with Tony Brunt. Is that a relative of Peter Brunt who's here? <laughs> um, and he was giving a presentation on German Samoan history, and I um, spotted this young Melanesian girl in Samoa. So this is an image of um, in Apia, and um, apparently there's like a German naval vessel that was that was coming into port and I just saw this young Melanesian girl and I and I, I just thought oh that's actually really interesting in terms of you know other Pacific people having like black help in terms of that colonial history and it's just it's such a, a taboo and overlooked um, topic and so that got me really interested in um, the history of um, indentured labour um, not just um, to Australia but actually across the Pacific and so um, it was through Tony Brunt um, that I got these images um, that came from a German family. And this is the last um, 
vessel that sailed from Melanesia, I believe it was the Solomon Islands, that sailed into Apia um, of the indentured labourers. And I just, I just think it's so important to, for people to see this history, um, especially Melanesians, because there's a lot of ancestors who were lost, like apparently 7,000 Melanesians were taken by um, German um, traders to work on the largest copper plantation in Samoa. So, and a lot of those people, were, uh, a lot of communities still don't know what happened to their ancestors. And so I put the question to community and it just kind of exploded in terms of um, the the references and the sources that I found. Um, so I'm still I'm still kind of researching this and looking into it and trying to chase up leads. And I've I've managed to track down the register list of all the names of all of the labor, um, all the indentured laborers from it was something from like 1864 to 1913. It was like pretty pretty significant amount of time. Um, and so um, when I actually asked my, um, the New Guinea Islands community um, about um, this history, I just, I just posed a question on social media and I said, uh, has anybody um, got any personal stories about ancestors going to, um, to Samoa and did they come back? And that just started a massive conversation around um, uh, people whose family members did go, some that came back, some that didn't. Um, it just, it was, it was so, it's such an under-researched area in terms of um, Melanesian stories of um, indentured labour and some of those people coming back. There's, I know there's a lot of research that was done in the Samoan community and so um, uh, I ended up finding out that there were these songs um, that were, um, that are still sung today um, that are about this particular history. And so I, I've created a playlist. If you just Google Abot songs um, in YouTube, this will, this playlist will come up and you can listen to it. Um, a lot of the songs are sung in Tokpisin, um, Pidgin English and my language of a Tinatatuna. And so it's Tokpisin that is the, um, I, I realized, I, I found out that Pidgin English basically evolved on the German ships and in the plantations of Samoa. And so it was through um, uh, another Samoan historian, um, Malama Meliasia, who um, actually has done a significant amount of research on this. He, um, he basically, um, uh, what was it? Um, he, was, he was talking about how in his research that the Duke of York Islands, which was the first image that I opened up with, was this station where a lot of the German vessels would go out on their um, copper schooners, go out to the Melanesian Islands, collect mostly um, Melanesian men and boys and sometimes women and bring them back to the Duke of York Islands. And it was there that they actually loaded all the bodies onto the ships and they all sailed to Samoa. And so um, that um, those those sailing ships ended up becoming stories that were sung in songs, and they keep getting and they get passed down through generations and reinterpreted. And um, it's there's it's so hard to do research in COVID, and so I've had to do most of my communication with community through um, social media. So um, I just wanted to really highlight this because that's it's a different form of um, of, of, of history um, in terms of like cultural history, and that's it's very very Papua New Guinean thing, and so. Like even when Sir, Mark, Sir Michael Samare died, like Papua New Guinea's first prime minister, there were all of these songs that people started singing about, mostly men, mostly Papua New Guinea men were singing songs about our prime minister. Um, so the most recent work that I've made was for the um, Australian War Memorial and it was looking at the FMI sisters. And so this was the Catholic convent that was established by the Europeans in Rabaul. And it was the first Catholic mission, first successful Catholic mission in all of Papua New Guinea. And the FMI sisters were became the first indigenous um, independent convent in Papua New Guinea. And in during the Second World War, when Rabaul was occupied by Japan and it was an Australian territory, um, a lot of the European missionaries were gathered up by the Japanese and taken into camps. Um, and it was these women uh, who actually kept the um, POWs alive for three years. And not many people knew about that history. And it was just a little, a little story that I found and I researched it and spent three weeks in Rabaul and spoke to a lot of the sisters over in the convent. And 
um, found out such amazing, amazing stories. And uh, I made this I made this artwork drawing on the archives of the Australian War Memorial, and this was the only image that I found of these women, um, and they're standing in the actual POW camp in in Ramallah, and you can see there's the Australian soldiers behind them. Um, that was the day that they liberated the um, the the POWs. Um, it was the 14th of September, 1945. So, um, and I put flowers into their veils and the, the flowers represent the different nationalities of all the Europeans. And so you've got the German corn flower, you've got um, the Irish clover, there's the Belgian poppy, um, you've got the French iris, um, you've got the uh, Swedish twin flower, then there's the Austrian um, Edelweiss, uh, the English rose. And I've also got the Japanese, um, cherry blossom and a Korean hibiscus. And that references the, um, the comfort women that were brought over by the Japanese to Rabaul. And so the, in Rabaul was like one of the biggest um, comfort stations in terms of like military prostitution. And the majority of the women that were brought over were from Okinawa and Korea. And so um, I couldn't, oh, it's sorry, a Lisa, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry. I'm almost done. Yep, great. Um, I can't see the chat, so sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, oops, what have I got? Hang on. Uh, I'm going to skip through. Yeah, I'm almost done. Um, anyway, I found all their names too. 45, 40, the, of the 45 sisters, I found 40 names in the archives. So it was about naming them as well. Um, this is the convent in Vunapope, which means place of the Pope. Um, um, and I found, also found in the archives, uh, the origins of the Unser Deutsch community, um, these mixed race children here. And this is the descendants of the Unser Deutsch community that live in Brisbane today. So I met them a couple of years ago and still have a lot of contact with them. And um, this is some artwork that I'm actually gonna be exhibiting at the Brooker Museum for the Kirchner and Nolde exhibition that's gonna be presented in Berlin next month. And so this is just uh, some things that I'm putting together now. and. Um, I've also this is this is something else that's going to go in um, into that work. So I've got an image of Albert Hull with his Tolai wife, and I actually found out that her name is Yawada Wakai. And I've got three different languages here. I've got my language, which is what Albert Hull spoke. I've got the Unterdeutsch language, and then I've got the German language in there. So it was just about kind of trying to show the history of all the different languages and the communities that kind of evolved out of the German colonialism in Rebel. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, congratulations on finding her name. Uh, I know that you were looking. <laughs> um, and we'll move straight on to Anoti Ogbabor, please. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hello, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. And okay. we can see your slides. Okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is Enotie Obebo. I'm an artist um, based in Benin City, uh, that is in Edo State in Nigeria. And today I'm going to share um, some of the work which I do in Benin and um, the larger implications of these projects. Um, about five years ago, I founded um, the Edo Global Art Foundation in Benin. And my private studio is called Nosona Studios. Um, this studio is on seven floors and we have about 20 artists um, who have spaces uh, well, individual spaces in the next slide please in the studio and most of these artists normally we graduate from schools and schools universities around and find their way to the bigger cities and um, yeah, 
and then begin to wrestle with the vagaries of uh, professional life. So we have been able to stop the flow and to give them a chance to stay back and learn more about the culture and deepen their knowledge because Benin City is like a, a hotbed of culture and it's the primary subject of the discussions about the Benin bronzes and the restitution debate um, globally. Um, and in 2019, we started a collaboration with the archives of Notco Thomas, which are normally, which are based in the Cambridge uh, Museum of uh, Archaeology and Anthropology in the, at the Cambridge Museum University. Uh, we collaborated with uh, Professor Paul Basu, who was retracing the steps of uh, Notco Thomas, who came to Benin City in 19, between 1909 and 1910. This was about 12 years after the British invasion of Benin City, of Benin Kingdom uh, in 1897, which resulted in the looting, the burning of the city, the massacring of a large number of people, the sacking of the king, and the looting of these artifacts, which resulted in their spread uh, to over 160 museums globally. And um, in interrogating these archives, we were able to get about 15 younger artists to collaborate, to go through more than uh, over 2,000 photographs, which are part of the archives of Marco Thomas, and to provoke a response and produce works, which uh, is as a result of their interaction with these uh, archives. And amongst these artists, you had uh, painters, sculptors, uh, textile artists, and video, video artists. And they all, we had a series of workshops and discussions. And, Jim, and uh, it was obvious that with our system of education, a lot of people um, were not very um, familiar. We're not very familiar with uh, the history of uh, that led to colonialism, starting from the Berlin Conference where Africa was partitioned and the subsequent military campaigns that led to the partition of Africa and the colonialism, colonization that was put in place. And so a lot of these younger artists were able to benefit from examining these archives and learning about this history. And in their responses, to have the next slide, please. In their responses, uh, we had um, a lot of uh, revelations. That was a picture of my studio in Benin City. And here, we're able to produce a lot of works, which today uh, are on a, on a exhibition at the Cambridge yeah, University uh, Museum. Um, there, are, there are a lot of things that uh, one would like to highlight when it comes to the effect of colonialism and how it has affected my practice and affected uh, the practice of a lot of artists coming out of Nigeria and to some extent, to a large extent, Africa. A lot of these um, uh, artists have been trained under a colonial system of education, which highlights um, the achievements of Western um, colonial history and the history of Western civilization, as opposed to uh, the history of indigenous peoples. And so there is uh, a colonial mentality that has been put in place. Um, which highlights the, the superiority of the Western civilization. And so you find till this day, next slide, please. Uh, till this day, we have uh, graduates and artists. Yeah, so here we organize, we regularly try to organize uh, workshops and seminars to share um, 
a lot of knowledge and information with um, younger artists and artists in general and people who are interested, uh, members of the public, to tell them about this history, to tell them about our civilization, which um, of our kingdom, the Benin kingdom, which uh, is over 2000 years old. Uh, we are better known for our bronzes and artifacts made in ivory, beads, terracotta, wood, leather, and textiles, most of which were created between the 14th century and the 19th century, and which, as you can see, as evidence from my studio, we keep creating till this day. Um, this uh, this uh, colonial situation has resulted in museums uh, classification of works coming from Africa as ethnographic works, as opposed to uh, artistic creations. And this has led to a very important gap, which I think museums can address today, can begin to address today. You see works coming out of Africa and from other indigenous peoples around the world who are non-Caucasian, are normally qualified as ethnographic. And so in the global chronology of art history, the works coming out from Africa and other Asian peoples, indigenous peoples are left out. And so if you keep teaching children in the Western, in Europe and America, um, art history, and you keep leaving out the creation of of artworks from Africa and from other indigenous peoples from the chronology, then you're going to keep reinforcing this racism and the whole ideology, the whole idea that works coming from Africa and from other indigenous people are inferior and were only created either because they had interactions with their colonial, with their colonizers. Uh, for instance, you can imagine the impact that the realization that when Michelangelo was creating the, the works during re the Renaissance, we were creating bronze plaques, which depicted our history and our culture and our tradition in Benin in the 14th century as well. And all through the 14th century, 15th century, the 16th century, and all the times when Shakespeare, Bach, and Picasso, and all of them were creating the masterpieces which the West and civilization celebrates today. The works of art coming from Benin were also encapsulating of all of these aspects and branches of creativity. If you look at the Benin plaque, which talks about our story, our stories are normally embedded with songs. They're embedded with poetry. They're embedded with proverbs. They're embedded with wise sayings, which have been handed over from generation to generation. And so a single plaque becomes a repository of history, a repository of music, a repository of poetry, of literature, of dance, of whatever it is. So if you remove that plaque, it is like removing the work of Michelangelo, removing the work of Da Vinci, removing the work of Shakespeare, of Bach, all in one fell swoop. And so it is important that the, the relevance of these works and the depth of knowledge and civilization, uh, next slide please, um, should also be shared with the public, with the Western public, so that um, it is obvious that civilization didn't just spring up in one part of the world and then it was spread by colonizers uh, to other parts of the world. Civilization sprung up in different parts of the world and sometimes simultaneously. And so if the museums um, can recognize that art is art, it cannot be determined by the race that produces it or determined by the geographical location, but only by its ability to evoke an emotional response, which brings about an interaction which is productive, either in thinking or in doing, or even in relationships amongst peoples. And so 
Um, we have the um, next slide, please. And so in establishing a studio, my studio is on um, seven floors. Uh, that's the bronze, uh, uh, the bronze mask, which is pre presently on exhibition at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. Um, we've established a hub, which is very close to the quarters where the um, Igun bronze casters. Uh, there are some other slides I couldn't show because uh, we're having some technical difficulties with them. Uh, and so we have created a hub where a lot of uh, international artists, local artists, and visitors in general can come and see how multidisciplinary uh, practices incorporate the Asian practices of our forefathers with the present day practices, contemporary practices um, in the creative world. Um, we use paint now, we use, uh, uh, we use a variety of media and we try to incorporate our contemporary experiences and our historical experiences to showcase this and share this. But more importantly, um, I think it is important that the colonization of the mind begins with proper education. We keep talking about returning um, items, returning artifacts, but we, we forget that everything starts from the mind. There is a lot that needs to be put in place uh, to ensure that um, we all get to sit, have an equal uh, place at the table um, to ensure that uh, there's a mutual exchange of ideas and creativity, which will lead to situations of the greater good, as opposed to a situation where um, there is a superior or there's an inferior culture. And the perception of museums as colonial bastions for showcasing the spoils of imperialism also has to change. Um, before, even in the Western civilization, before now, a lot of the um, artworks were not created solely for museums. They were created to adorn homes and adorn castles and adorn churches and adorn public spaces. And so when you now decide to segregate artworks and show them only in these bastions which are created under the ages of imperialism and colonialism, then you're going to also alienate your own citizenry. And if your citizenry cannot come to terms with the truth, uh, with the true re re um, reality of situations al around the world, then you keep perpetuating this colonialism, uh, keep perpetuating this uh, theory of racism. And here in Nigeria um, and in Benin City, we have started with, uh, next slide please. Uh, Enotia, can you uh, please start to wrap yeah. up? Thank you. Okay. All right, so that's a picture of my studio. Uh, just keep flipping the slides and I'll just keep talking. Uh, and so when it comes to colonialism, I would like to talk about the benefits of our project with uh, the Cambridge um, University SOAS and Paul, um, Paul Basu. In going through these archives in 1909, the positive side of the ethnographic uh, project was that uh, a lot of people in society got to see pictures of their ancestors for the first time, because these pictures were dug out from the archives of the um, Notco Thomas, which were taken uh, in 1909. And the reconnection with memory, the reconnection with um, their history also brought a lot of joy. And we're able to compare the situation in a lot of places and the situation and how they've turned out today uh, in modern times. And so there's a, whole, a lot of uh, historical relevance and knowledge wrapped up in ethnographic museums, which I think can be beneficial even to indigenous people. But I also believe that uh, in liberalizing these uh, uh, items and bring it back, uh, bringing them back to the indigenous people, uh, their restitution, it should be through the restitution of the mind and the restitution of actual objects to enable the people to come to terms with who they are. Because when you know who you are, then you can also 
uh, find fashion out a future which uh, carries mutual respect for all peoples for yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and we'll move straight on to Tessa Mars. Hello, everyone. My name is Tessa Mars. I'm a Haitian visual artist, and I'm currently a resident at the Rex Academy in Amsterdam. I, uh, I'm going to be brief <laughs> and maybe raise a couple points. Um, first one was that I had the opportunity to go see the Kushner and Noel the show. And that um, I went in like I usually do when I penetrate the uh, ethnographic museum and art museum with a lot of wariness and guided, uh, guardedness because you never know where the heat is coming from, uh, either through an image, through, through a text, through most often the erasure that, that is so obvious to me as someone coming from Haiti and that has its own dominant narrative of uh, revolution and successful um, house, outing of the colonizer, but also the many silences that transform into a kind of violence. And I think that uh, uh, people of black people, people of color, people that live on land that were former colonies cannot really afford to stay to be ignorant of the the I mean we we have no choice but to know what is not being said and I think that uh, the holding on to um, ignorance is a privilege that we do not have and so in in many ways uh, um seeing this information uh, that I felt that I was very aware of but of course I didn't know the details because I don't necessarily know the history of uh, this particular area in the world through dates but there is a commonality in the experience that was that is shared that I I felt uh, ready to engage with and so I was particularly pleased to be able to see the videos of scholars that pertain to these cultures um, put uh, bring bring forth for me the contemporary <laughs> The contemporariness of the of the questions that are raised by the presence of of these objects in in their futures. Uh, a second point I'd like to to raise is that um, it it was brought to my attention through the um, the showing about the centered around the colonial exhibitions is uh, and and the focus on the performers and their agency and. Uh, it brought me back to the invitations I've had in the past to, to participate in shows in art museums, and that were often uh, uh, some uh, presented as Haitian surveys. And uh, so, so in these spaces, you are reduced to, of course, the stereotypes, but in case of Haiti is, uh, of course, devil worshippers because voodoo, and then you have uh, poverty and uh, a kind of uh, exceptional resilience. And, and those things really reduce you and, and, and simplify your message. And uh, often also, I am the only women uh, artist uh, um, uh, part of, of the collective exhibit and, and, and it feels really like tokenization. And in fact, uh, I'm just doing service to, to, to the agendas of whatever it is that the museum is trying to put forward. And of course, showing your work in the museum is one of the achievements of an artist's career. But then I wrestle with the fact that maybe I actually don't want to be known and I actually, do not want to be the object of study in any shape or form. And because there's, I feel a certain danger in that, that is inherent to, to history and how we have been studied in the past, but also a protection that I feel opacity can offer you that uh, you, there are still places to hide. And finally, also, the question of can I really be an ambassador for my people and represent them when my voice is only one of many that I know I'm, I'm aware that I have also myself a lot of privileges even in, in my own country and also that in my work itself I often realize that I, I have reproduced hierarchies and that serve a message that some sometimes I don't even realize makes the 
the happiness of those that continue vehiculating the images of Haitians as the devil worshippers, etc. So I, I had planned to show some images uh, of my work, but I will not show a lot. Only one um, video of it, something I'm working on. It's one minute <laughs> right now. So um, I feel rushed. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the my my practice is painting based, and I've deal with a lot of self representation, introducing myself to history, dealing with the revolutionary body, and 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 what it means to that a fat black female uh, body is being put in the skin of the father of the revolution. And it has come to my attention that I was still reproducing a kind of violence by doing that, and that actually at the moment where I'm speaking with you, um, I'm, I'm more and more thinking that I'm more interested in the community building that was part of the revolution as the heart of what it meant to um, uh, cease uh, to, to part with the French um, um, empire. And so I'm thinking a lot about uh, my, my attention, my attachment to production of image and thinking more about how I can still uh, produce work that is meaningful uh, via um, other means and, and sound work in particular. And so this is a quick uh, little video. It's a, I'm gonna share with you. It's a lullaby. And I found it when I was trying to figure out uh, what connection existed between Haiti and, and the Netherlands uh, outside maybe the obvious. Um, and so, I found this little lullaby and I will let you enjoy it. Uh, is there sound? Do you not hear it? No. Sorry about that. But I mean, I guess the, the lyrics are. <laughs> oh, you can sing to us. So I'm sorry <laughs> that uh, it didn't uh, come through, but I, it is on my website, testamos.com. So if ever you want to hear it, uh, feel free to, to visit and to be able to see images of my painting and drawings and figure out a bit of uh, all I was saying. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll definitely be visiting your uh, website to hear that. I'm, uh, I really like the idea of a tree cutting someone back. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think we've used our, well, I'm certain we have used our buffer time, which was programmed in. Um, so we'll move uh, straight to our conversation, which first I'd like uh, to invite uh, any of the panelists uh, to respond to each other and each other's presentations. I just want to make a comment. Um, it's something I've already mentioned in the chat um, about how I really appreciated um, seeing Enoti and Dickie's practice of working with community and just the power of art in terms of collectivity. I think that's, that's it's just so important to be doing those things, um, it's particularly when you're living in the homelands and you're working there. Like it's just, I think uh, art is one of those things that's just so intangible to measure, but um, when you work together with community, it, it can have so much power. And when I was seeing a lot of the, um, the work that um, Dickie was doing in the West Papuan community, I was just thinking, oh, wow, like that's, like culture is the weapon, like music is power in terms of like, trying to create change and um, have agency in really, really difficult political social situations. So just want to acknowledge their work. Yeah. 
Thank you. Would anyone else like to jump in? Uh, I think, uh, Stephanie, uh, you have a question? Yeah. Actually, I think Beatrice was first. Oh, sorry. Beatrice? Oh, we can't hear you. Okay, now, yes. <laughs> Um, yes, no, I just wanted to say as well that um, basically add to what Lisa has been saying that it, I thought it was great to see uh, this work, I mean to see all of your work as you know, what you do yourself, but also this work with the communities, and also to see how uh, tradition and contemporary art comes together basically and how it, uh, this continuity um, of, of art in different parts of the world, I think that's really fantastic to see. And, uh, I just wish we had included that a little bit more in our exhibition. So there is a regret there, uh, but it is great uh, to work with you on this exhibition anyway. So thank you. Next it was time. not a question really. But <laughs> <laughs> Next time you can include that work, uh, yes. maybe invite Dickie over to <laughs> have a residency. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah, Stephanie. Oh, thank you. That was really, really uh, inspiring. And um, actually, I have a question which uh, was in my mind yesterday also, but I, I did not have time to ask it. Was I was wondering if um, there had been any conversation or uh, ideas about bringing maybe a, a version of the Kirchner and all the exhibition to uh, Papua New Guinea or to uh, 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 Benin City or something like that um, to kind of reverse the uh, the, co the collaboration uh, a bit and of course I, I just wanted to say that um, it was very interesting to see how the categories we talked about this morning were not uh, so relevant uh, in the afternoon with uh, contemporary artists at work so uh, thank you for that it was really really uh, great can I just briefly answer that yep sure um, yeah we, we did discuss that uh, briefly in the beginning um, but I mean, as almost all of the artworks in the exhibition are not ours, uh, it turned out to be really not feasible um, because I mean, we would have asked all the lenders to send their works on such a partly very long journey and uh, it would have been really quite, quite impossible. We would have done, been able to do it if they were all from our own collections. Uh, Anatia? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was just going to uh, make a statement, uh, a compliment on the uh, statement on the uh, Krishna and Nolde exhibition, which I saw uh, in uh, at the Stedelijk in Amsterdam. Um, I was really impressed with the exhibition because, um, apart from the collaboration we had with uh, the Notko Thomas exhibition, where the uh, photographs of uh, Notko Thomas were put side by side with the contemporary interpretations. It was very interesting to see the extent of research and work that um, went into the production of this exhibition. Uh, because uh, you see, being we're talking about decolonizing, decolonization and decolonizing the museums. And previously, works of um, Western artists were always presented as um, works by themselves, being inspired by themselves or by some Western source. And so to openly acknowledge the source of uh, some of their inspiration and to put it side by side in such a creative manner that tells the story in an unambiguous manner, I think that was very brave and I think that was very enlightening and I think that was very helpful to decolonizing museums and decolonizing the minds of anybody who comes in to view the exhibition. So uh, job well done um, to all of you who were involved in that uh, um, exhibition and putting up the exhibition. I think that was very well done. Yeah. I mean, even the dancers who inspired some of the works, the photographs, they fetched them out, got them, put them up, 
acknowledging the sources. And, you know, I think that was very, that was very well done. Thank you. And Beatrice, would you like to respond? Yes, actually, I'm doing too much of the talking now. But anyway, thank you so much, Inatye. And, and actually, also, Tessa, for your comments. It's, it's really great to hear yeah, that you felt comfortable in the exhibition. That's really important to me. And I'm sure to everybody who's participated in the preparation. Um, I, I so just wanted to also respond to a comment by Ivono in the in the chat. Um, yeah, we did have plans originally to to travel to Papua New Guinea um, and uh, to show reproductions of uh, works by Nolde there because we wouldn't have been able to get the originals um, and uh, discuss the works with people there. I mean, together we had this plan to go with together with uh, so daughter Orson and I, and together with uh, Nicola Garnier from uh, Cape Only. Um, and uh, yeah, this unfortunately fell through um, partly because of Corona. Uh, but I think it would have been interesting to get a different perspective in the exhibition um, and to to really uh, discuss not only the the reception of Nofnolde, but also to discuss uh, the traces of colonialism and uh, what is still felt there now. Uh, so yeah, we found a different way of including a perspective from Papua New Guinea uh, through our work group uh, on Papua New Guinea, including uh, Nancy and Lisa and Erna and Wono. Uh, but I mean, it would have been great also to have been able to travel there. Maybe one day it will still be possible, who knows? <laughs> but not in the context of this exhibition, unfortunately. Uh, Anna, um, so Dickie, I'm, uh, I was interested to hear you mention, well, you, you discussed it uh, to some degree, um, using the archives and reproducing in a way or reconstructing aspects of uh, culture that have been lost that um, obviously you and your group, you're aware of the loss. And so you're rebuilding something, but you're, you're using the arena of art and contemporary art as your way to rebuild those things. Um, I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit more about that and perhaps mention um, how you engaged with the archives too. How did you uh, dig into that? Well, um, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Lisa, for your uh, appreciation for us. And this discussion really uh, inspired me and energized me uh, to keep moving forward and working. And yeah, uh, first I want to uh, give a response to what Lisa said about the collective's uh, works. Uh, in our situation, it's really, really important to work collectively. I always say it inside the collective and I say to the artists, look, uh, your art now, it's not only about you, your art about the people, your art is the bridge to uh, raising the awareness and voices that isolated in West Papua through uh, to the outside, the outside the world because our homeland now uh, became the most isolated region, one of the most isolated region in Indonesia. You cannot find any signal in the regional journalist come to West Papua to try to uh, make a report on human rights situation there. So uh, in this time, uh, we need some uh, place to, to, to evacuate our forces. And we think that contemporary art is the right uh, uh, spaces to live where you can you can see by your ideas and character and, and not because you're the way uh, the place where you come from um yeah uh, in our practice uh, we look back to our our past and we use whatever we uh we we can use i mean <clears throat> you know when when uh, the indonesian army come to west papua uh, in the beginning of uh, 1917 uh, in the last of 1960, uh, they burned many archives uh, uh, regarding the Papuans' uh, heritage and our past. 
So they are mislinking with this generation, with our past, but uh, some memory, uh, collective memory still still there in the people. Uh, so what we do is uh, we go to the village and uh, ask to the elders, ask the elders and documenting their, um, their, uh, their, their talk and uh, try to record their seat where, they, where they're singing. And uh, we also try to uh, trace the, the archives uh, that uh, now open sources in many museums and especially in Netherlands and many books uh, we try to read it back and uh, try to see oh look this is how uh, the people of what open lives in the past or oh, this is uh, the beliefs of Koreri that already finished with the come of the Christianity so uh, uh, we don't have to surrender with the situation so uh, we try to reconstruct the beliefs back but with our ways of course <laughs> and, and uh, uh we see that our artists really really get uh, exciting with this uh practice and to engage with uh, social co uh, community also in the village um uh, because you know uh if you come to the village people don't know about what is different of ethnology or what is uh what is different of ethnology with contemporary art people just look at okay you can do something here just uh, we can do it we, we do it together so um uh that's why uh, uh what lisa said is uh, work collectively uh is is something important for me for for us in the situation great thank you very much uh would anyone else like to ask a question Okay. Um, well, then I might ask another question. Oh, sorry, be a good. I was just just listening to these fascinating uh, uh, presentations and also perhaps a bit in the light of the uh, previous uh, panel and also uh, Dickie's uh, statement just just a moment ago that people don't see the difference between um, ethno ethnography and art or ethnographic objects and art. So I, maybe it could be a kind of devil's advocate question, perhaps, but uh, so I very well understand why uh, the uh, concept of art is embraced also as a possibility to indeed enter uh, all kinds of, of circles that might be closed, really, ideologically, practically, if things are done in a way on the ticket of popular culture or uh, what have you. But I would be interested if we could think about uh, also possible pitfalls, perhaps, that come with this very broad, uh, all embracing uh, um, framing of uh, all kinds of activities in terms of art. And uh, Anna, you have also referred, uh, spoken about this, saying, well, we should perhaps start uh, from material culture and then see how all kinds of frames are made possible, uh, uh, also impede perhaps certain possibilities of connecting and so on. So I wonder whether you could, we, we could return uh, uh, to that question. And I, I would be very much interested, for example, to hear from, hear from uh, Diki, but also from other uh, presenters, how they think about this and whether they see perhaps also certain pitfalls. It may be that art as a frame might also be some kind of Trojan horse, right? So I would be very interested in your uh, reflections uh, uh, about this, but it's it's intended as a bit polemic, uh, as you may realize. Yeah. I'm happy Lisa? to um, yep. start. <laughs> Go for it. Um, <laughs> so yeah art is a western word like there's no word for art in in my language or in many pacific or indigenous languages because art for us is life like it's part of our everyday like a lot of the objects that are considered ethnographic by europeans are our everyday items <laughs> like they're just uh they were just part of um our customs and practices and so it's it, when i hear this division of separation of ethnographic objects and I, I I don't I that's not my phrasing that's not my categorization like that's not that's not how I see it like it's just there's no division because there is no separation of art like in terms of 
the pitfalls of art is that it's very limited in terms of like, okay, in a Western context, we do art by going to an event or we go and see this thing or we go to a film or we go to a dance. Like, it's just kind of like this thing that you do. Whereas the way that we practice art, I guess, particularly in Papua New Guinea, is it's just a part of every day. Like it's, you know, someone might be singing or, oh, someone's died. Okay, we've got to do that custom. Um, someone's had, had a birth or someone needs, like, it's just, it's not, I feel like, working in the diaspora, working in a Western society today, I have to use art as a vehicle to enable me to continue practicing my culture and my understanding of that knowledge. That's how I use art. There are downfalls to that because then I, my family don't even understand what I do in the village. Like they go, what are you doing? <laughs> I just say I'm a photographer because <laughs> that's how they understand it. Like they don't even know what an artist does. Like they just, it's not a, it's not a, it's not, you know, like the artists that I know are the cultural practitioners. You know, one of the first trips I went on when I went back to Papua New Guinea as a 16 year old teenager, the, one of the first things my mum did was she took me and my brother to this man who we went down to the valley. He lived near this extinct volcano and we went inside his hut and he had the most amazing sculptures. So he would he would have made like similar things like you would have seen in the Kirshner and Nolde exhibition of the, um, the two dancing items. Um, in Arba that are in the room um, with an older's work of the parrots and the, the tropical forests. And so he made things like that. And my mum went, went and commissioned him to make a drum for my brother. So that's that was our art. Like we, we just go see someone, you know, oh, you can make this for me, great. Oh, I want this song. We get one of our musicians to write a song for us and then they sing it and then we hear it on the radio. It's just, that's how it is. And so there, there are, yeah, I mean, someone else can jump in and talk about their own pitfalls of art, but I have to use it as a vehicle in terms of the way I live today. Yep, Nancy, jump in. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry, again. So now I just want to um, echo Lisa's uh, notes. Um, um, I mean, if we look at, um, yeah, my art is an expression of humanity, of our identity, of our collective identity also, and that it is viewed by others in such a way is also very clear because let's not forget also that Arnold Up was murdered because of his practice. He was murdered because he collected um, artistic um, uh, and heritage um, um, expressions from several peoples uh, in around Papua. So here we can al already read and see how art and politics are deeply interrelated. But the other way around, if we look at, um, so things that Dickie expressed reminded me very much actually of how the Black Archives in Amsterdam operate that were um, founded five, six years ago and everyone, knows the Black Archives, wants to work with the Black Archives, etc., cetera, um, which is a sort of a Black-owned, Black-centered archive. They work with art um, also very um, clearly and, and artists and, and, and became curators overnight, so to speak, uh, because indeed it is a form of expression that um, um, I think also touches the imaginary in a way that, for instance, scholarly work cannot convey. So I think that's also an important uh, aspect. So notions of, you know, affect and emotion, uh, but also just, you know, the fact that we are creative people. So uh, with quality, uh, that those notions are also um, expressed in that way. Uh, but yeah, so, um, fed off of this deep uh, understanding of art and politics being deeply interrelated. Um, so yesterday when I mentioned the, uh, the New Island works uh, in the room, I hesitated a moment before I said the word artworks because it just felt wrong. And so in my head, I was quickly doing the calculation of <laughs> am I doing a disservice to those objects? Um, and then I realized, well, actually a creative work is capable of supporting many kinds of interpretation and being uh, uh, 
given its context at this very moment, it is an artwork. <laughs> so, so, you know, this is all in, in two seconds. I'm having to think, oh, what am I doing when I say artwork, when I talk about this? And so uh, I decided to go with it. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's just a, a note to, to mention the complexities of this and uh, recognize that too. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Erna, because the um, the thing with museum collections, uh, particularly like you know, with, with the Mulligan masks, like there, there's so many of them in terms of like the replication of them and the collection of them in museums, and I think people start to because they, you see them so often because they're supposed to be discarded, like the. Um, I think the replication of them makes you stop seeing the distinctive the distinctiveness of them and the longer I started working with collections I started to see that there was actually individual like individual detail and individuality embedded in the designs and so it may look the same but whoever made that has actually come up with that like they've imagined that and that's what I think is so amazing in terms of like Indigenous creativity is it's just drawn from around you like it's there's no it's it's like this pure kind of um I guess inspiration from from the life that you live and the people that you are surrounded by and these kind of practices and so um I think it's very easy to kind of mistake that things are just kind of all the same and it's like you've got to have all of these particular objects in your collection to kind of say that you've got them but they're actually if you look at them and you kind of compare them all they're actually all very unique um and I think rather than calling them artworks maybe just call them the actual names that the Indigenous people refer to them as mm. because that that puts them back puts the value back into what the object was yeah uh, one thing I also noticed during the session if no one wants to jump in, um, was <laughs> actually that in each of the arts practices that ego was very much uh, less than one might normally think in the uh, artistic practice. So in particular, the collective, the idea of working with collective and consul consultation um, and uh, you know, even get, getting permission to do certain things, for example, all, all of that consultative work that is done um, in order to make work that is not uh, not another kind of violence or exploitation. And so it actually does something very constructive and uh, enriching rather than more damage. Um, yeah, so it's something I, I, I noticed in all of those uh, presentations. Also, I just want to uh, say that um, in the context of um, the when we say art, because a lot of us uh, were educated through the colonial educational system, it sort of gives you a context in which to consider art. And then when you look at it retroactively, um, you begin to, if you, if you want to reconcile it with, um, for instance, let me use the archives, which was very richly collected by Notko Thomas. We found out that there are some items which were clearly very intricately carved, and so which, as contemporary artists, we uh, were blown away, wowed us, and we were like, wow, this is amazing. But there were things like stools, like uh, baskets, like, uh, certain things which, uh, I mean, you can find stools and baskets all over the world, but the way these stools were made and the way the baskets were woven were uh, indigenous to this style, was indigenous to our people, you know? And so in terms of trying to tell the story of uh, a people, uh, ethnographically, so you could use certain uh, items like the stools and the baskets and stuff which combs and stuff which could easily be replicated. But in my practice, I've often come to realize that art and in the context of the Benin bronzes, because every each Benin bronze is an original, because through the lost wax method, when you 
produce each work. Each mold is lost in a fire. So you do not have a mold to keep replicating works. So each work has to be made from scratch and each work is cast individually. And so when you look at, and even in that case, you find some that are so poorly made that the concept of art which just does not arise in your mind. But there are some that are so well made that you just have to say, wow, this is just out of this world. So I think sometimes the way the objects, what they evoke uh, can also qualify how you consider them as art. But if you are gonna separate ethnographical objects from art objects, then I think um, you can draw a line. Uh, it might be a fine line, but definitely there's a line because things that can be replicated easily like baskets, like stools, like chairs, like stuff, which were made uh, in the 19th century or the 18th century, tell a story about the ethnographical lifestyle of the people, you know? But things which were made 500 years ago or 600 years ago, which carry a certain beauty, which carry a certain storytelling ability, and which carries the capacity to evoke a certain type of emotion from whoever is beholding it. I think this then just has to qualify as art. Uh, Tessu, would you like to respond to her? Yeah. Yes, yes. I wanted to add that I, I myself find it very fascinating um, the role, at least in Haiti, that I've noticed that the creators themselves often get to decide what it is that they're making depending on the outsider's uh, demand, if you want. So in turn, the, the object they create or the painting that they make becomes part of ritual. Uh, yes, it's an object that's, that's sacred, or then it becomes totally um, artisanal because that's, that's what the demand is for, or then it's it, it becomes art because, uh, well, it's going to go in the gallery and then they, they want art. And I think the negotiation in that tells a lot about, I guess, uh, um, a, a certain amount of carelessness when it comes to <laughs> needing to define what it is. I mean, not carelessness, but not caring at least uh, for 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 certain people and uh, and also how even in this capitalism has a, a big role to play because people are trying to you know make their way and 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 write uh manipulate the system as best they can and at least uh, in in the art uh, when it when if we circumscribe it to the art uh, uh, Haitian art uh, scene there's there's uh, so many divisions that are imposed when it comes to naive art or who has the la label contemporary that it, it it there's often a lack of power that you feel to be able to declare what it is so you play so you play and i think so uh, that that play might be a, an interesting lens to to uh take a look of of what's happening there with with uh, categorizing uh things one way or another um, I'd also like to make a comment uh, in response to um, Anotia. Um, I'm really glad that you brought up the the, the humble objects because actually uh, World Cultures Museums are full of uh, the utilitarian and humble uh, everyday things. And many of them have artistry in them, their aesthetic, uh, they can be very finely made. There can be a kind of virtuosity to their making but they don't necessarily um, lend themselves to being resituated in an art situation or being uh, described as art. Um, and so I think that whole uh, segment of the collections is sort of left out of the conversation when we're talking about the overlaps and, and um, commonalities or uh, the points of contact between art uh, museums and world cultures museums it's actually a subset of what world cultures have because a lot of it is and actually they have a different kind of value and it's not about their exhibitionary purposes uh, necessarily it can be as an archive and an archive for, that can be accessed by 
uh, well, researchers, but uh, researchers also from those places and cultural experts, because there's been disruption to culture, actually referring back to these pieces um, can be very inspiring. It can uh, spur you on to even finer works uh, because you see what was possible, um, just as, you know, seeing a very fine, finely made bit of cabinetry inspires you to, to lead uh, to do better and to refine what you're doing. Um, the same thing with basketry, for example. It's, you know, I've seen people's minds blown as they walk through the storage. And that is actually the more, uh, to me, the more meaningful purpose of, of these collections or more meaningful use, I should say. Uh, but Beatrice, you had your hand up first. But sorry, oh, sorry. <laughs> could I quickly respond to what you just said as well? Yep. Because I, I think I, I completely agree. And I think um, these objects can, while they are kind of encapsulating relationships, but also making relationships possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the, um, one of the kind of uh, things that they can do and that they are, have constantly been, been doing. Uh, and so in that sense, it might not, always be that useful to try and um, push them in a particular um, uh, subset of you know art or artifact uh, because they are often much more than that much more than art or much more than artifact so they, they enable this whole kind of set of world of relationships and I think uh, that's one of the really important things. Thank you. Uh, and Beatrice? Yes, I was just wondering, um, just thinking this through, but whether the relationship between um, the traditional arts, of, let's say in, in Papua New Guinea and contemporary art there would be similar to the relationship that we have here between um, the visual arts and the, and the arts and crafts. Um, but then there's, because there's always this distinction made between objects that are made for use and objects that are art with a big A as it were, uh, which is a distinction that's often being criticized as well, of course. Um, so I, I was just wondering whether the relationship is similar or whether it's, it's something entirely different and contemporary art is also more referring to uh, certain traditional practices. Uh, I wonder if we've still got Daniel uh, Waswas here. I can't uh, see everyone at the same time. Perhaps not. Is there anyone who'd like to respond to that? Well, I'll have a go. <laughs> so actually, I, I don't know. I, I really feel like uh, underqualified to respond. But from my observation, I, I see um, the engagement with oh, let's say traditional um, materials and, and material culture practices is more icon iconographic rather than uh, drawing directly on from those. So uh, it seems to be more Western um, art modes, but then with the icon iconography uh, of um, the traditions that exist. But I'm happy to be uh, disagree with <laughs> um, Lisa. Do you have any insights into this? Uh, I think the conversation, I guess, on this side of the planet, <laughs> um, in the oceanic region, is um, the conversation around what's in, in Papua New Guinea. I guess what's traditional and what's contemporary is kind of um, it doesn't really exist. Um, like it's, I think. In the contemporary context, it's like it's the way that things are curated, I guess, even here in, in Melbourne and Australia, like uh, objects that were made. Um, there is still that view that people think, oh, because it, it looks traditional, like that it's really old. Like even the MIDI that I made, which was I finished that in 2015, people thought it was old. <laughs> and it's like, yes, it is an old custom but I made it this century. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so what is it then, you know? Um, and so like Antisana Balai, she was the first Pacific curator at Australia's first national gallery here in, um, in Victoria. She was very adamant about not 
um, putting these labels, particularly on Melanesian art, because Melanesian art always gets seen as traditional and Polynesian art always gets seen as contemporary. And it's like, why, <laughs> why is that? <laughs> What's going on there? You know, and it's, it's, it's always been that way. And it's like, you know, we can't, we can't get out of this kind of tribal art sort of uh, confines. And, and that's not, that's, they're not categories that we've actually created. Um, and so like, I've, I know that I've struggled with that a lot um, because I don't live in the village. And so where do I fit, you know, in terms of being a contemporary artist who lives outside of Papua New Guinea? Um, and so I've had to find other ways to kind of make my practice, um, I guess, valid. And that's been on the global stage. Um, so, you know, and the, you can get into a deep conversation around authenticity, you know, and that's when it gets really complex. Um, but I think um, we... Yeah, I think I, I, the only way I can really describe this kind of conversation is to use talkis and it's like, oh, well, that's, you know, there are some things that are like, you know, that are referred to as, you know, time before, but like the old times, but then people are still making things. We still make the same things that we used to make, um, you know, hundreds of years ago, but we're, we just, it's just being reinterpreted with new materials, new paints, new designs, everything's reinterpreted, everything's reinvented and continued because that's culture it's not static and so you'll often find that the cultures in Papua New Guinea are more progressive than the cultures that are outside of Papua New Guinea because the people that like like myself who live you know outside of the homeland want to like hold on to like the old ways but then people back home in Papua New Guinea are like no nah, we're actually doing it this way now <laughs> we're actually using this material and we're using this new music and we're doing this and it's actually like they're actually more progressive than the communities here and it's so bizarre but it's like that's 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 culture like it's always changing it's always moving and so I think that's probably why we're struggling with this conversation is because you cannot contain it great thank it's you actually reminds me of uh, the other way around how Papuans for instance use different materials um so not uh, organic materials anymore but plastics for instance to weave and then people got really, you know, Westerners got really upset because, oh, no, you're <laughs> using the wrong material. Whereas, well, you know, you work with what you have and, and the continuity of it um, is also important. So I, I, I would agree very much with Lisa. And I think Dickie spoke to it. Sorry for not raising my hand, but just barging in. But, um, but as a Dickie <clears throat> also <clears throat> spoke of, uh, on it, I think, in a, in, in a different sense, but the notion of continuity rather than this divide of traditional versus contemporary um, is quite important. And, um, um, but it's also a hierarchical uh, division, right? It's, it's colonial, I think. Um, one differentiation, uh, because I, I, I need to think about acquisitions in the museum context and, uh, <laughs> and defending or arguing for the acquisition of different kinds of things and rather than concentrating on the I guess the qualitative uh, aspects of different kinds of material culture instead I think about who who was it aimed for so uh, contemporary art is what I think of as aimed at a different kind of audience than um, other kinds of material that are contemporary, but contemporary traditional, which is what I call it in my own mind. So contemporary traditional is made for it with the, the expectation of a different audience than contemporary art that's made for an international or global or, you know, the, the Sydney audience. So it's a, about um, moving my focus to what the expected reception was or that arena might be. So that then I'm not in the position of having to judge whether something is <laughs> is traditional or contemporary or or whatever. It's about something else then. Uh, are things going on in the chat? Should I be following that as well? <laughs> no, I don't think I will. Lots of things going on in the chat, but it's being safe. So okay. We can share Great. it later on. <laughs> I think that was a very good closing statement, actually, Anna. Oh, okay. Are we to time? <laughs> Is that... Uh...
Let me see. See you. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, uh, yeah, maybe we will we'll wrap it there. And I think it was really uh, such a great way to close the seminar because uh, if, well, I felt like we we're on a certain track yesterday, which was uh, the comparison or the, the various case studies that were presented to us in terms of the art galleries and what they're attempting to do, um, uh, to do with in, include, you know, increasing the level of context and uh, actually trying to deal with the difficult histories that are um, a part of the legacies that go alongside and uh, in which uh, the fine arts are actually embedded, uh, like colonialism. Um, and, and today we had, uh, at the beginning, uh, the first session today, we had uh, a similar thing, but in the context mostly of World Cultures Museums. Um, and I think Stephanie, I, I really enjoyed that you you used uh, the contrast with the other arts, uh, other types of museum uh, museums in Paris, in order to draw out the kinds of underlying uh, well prejudices or assumptions that are made about uh, material culture that is described as uh, uh, ethnographic. And yes, the museum was set up for exactly that uh, more complicated position of uh, uh, treating aesthetically things that might otherwise be world cultures um, uh, collections. And, uh, and then finally, I, why I really enjoyed the final panel as well is that it disrupted all of that because it, it kind of uh, short circuited the kind of uh, tracks that we'd fallen into with the big institutions and thinking about their world. And in fact, when art is done, it does something much more uh, chaotic and messy and creative uh, by definition, I guess, where it cr crosses boundaries and those boundaries don't really matter so much. And that's kind of the, the power of it. And also the, um, the power of the poetics of that too. So it's uh, such a great way to get outside of the boxes that we put ourselves in or that we get driven towards by being uh, people who work in institutions or who deal with institutions or who think through the systems of institutions on a regular basis. Um, so I, I thank the panelists in the final uh, session for that too. So uh, thank you very much to everyone who's participated, to the organizers. Um, I won't go through all the names because there are, there are many and we've, uh, we've got a website that mentions people. So <laughs> uh, thank you very much.